Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started now. I hope everybody can hear me. And uh, I hope everybody got all the emails over the weekend. I guess I sent them out on, on Friday, Thursday or Friday, with the links for the uh, videos uh, in YouTube. I want to try to get them out every day. Uh, as we get to them, it's a whole lot easier than to try and have to find them and send them out at the end of the week. So, um, but you should get uh, today's video uh, for lecture, uh, the link for the lecture and the link for the lab video uh, later on today. It just takes time to uh, get them to load up, but I should be able to get them done by the end of the day. So, anyway, if you can throw anything. Have you already took row? I'm going to go ahead and go into the uh, lecture. We are in, there we go. We had just finished talking about, we, we were starting to talk about the thyroid gland and problems with the thyroid gland. And we had talked about, uh, let me bring it up here. There we go. Um, we had talked about myxedemia or myxedema when we under secrete thyroid hormone. Where thyroid hormone is the regulator of metabolic activity. So we have to have adequate amounts of thyroid hormone for us to you know, release um, sufficient energy from the foods we eat to, to maintain you know, or what we consider normal activity. If we don't have enough thyroid hormone, we're not going to release enough energy from our foods. We're going to be sluggish and cold and irritable and constipated. And um, you know, we may get a goiter a swelling in the neck, for example. Um, the, um, one of the con consequences is also, as they say, is mental sluggishness. Uh, you know, it, it tend, in extreme cases, it can mimic the onset of a dementia. Now, there are a wide variety of dementias, not, you know, everybody says Alzheimer's. Alzheimer's is only one type of dementia. And yeah, I took role when uh, you came in. So, and uh, I got, I got everybody. So, okay. Now, as I said, there's, only, there's a variety of dementias. Mental sluggishness, you know, doesn't mean that you have dementia. It may be a thyroid issue too. Uh, but you know, people with, with uh, mixed edema can't process as quickly. Don't have enough energy. So, now a goiter. A goiter is something we rarely see in the United States at least not without an explanation for it. See, a goiter is an enlargement of the thyroid gland. Um, when thyroid hormone, normally what happens is that when the thyroid hormone levels drop, get below what we want to consider a normal level, the hypothalamus detects that. The hypothalamus sends a signal to the uh, pituitary gland, hey, thyroid hormone levels are low, <clears throat> let's stimulate the thyroid. So the um, pituitary gland releases thyroid stimulating hormone to act on the thyroid gland to make more thyroid hormone. Well, you know that um, the um, thyroid hormone is a mixture of thyroid lobulin and iodine. And that forms the colloid that's in the follicle cells in the thyroid gland. Gotta have iodine. Iodine is essential making thyroid hormone. Without iodine, no thyroid hormone. Now, if your patient is deficient in iodine uptake, for whatever reason, you know, they're not getting iodine, what will happen is thyroid hormone levels will drop. Okay, your hypothalamus detects that, stimulates the pituitary gland to make thyroid stimulating hormone, and it acts on the thyroid gland and the uh, thyroid gland makes lots and lots of thyroid lobulin. The follicle cells are busy churning out thyroid lobulin. 
but there's no iodine to combine to that with to form the thyroid hormone. Well, thyroid, uh, the hypothalamus still detects low thyroid hormone levels in the body, and it signals the pituitary gland to make more thyroid hormone. So the thyroid, the pituitary gland releases more TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. It acts in the thyroid. It stimulates the production of thyroid globulin by the follicle cells. But there's still no iodine present. The thyroid gland enlarges as, we, as the follicle cells churn out more thyroid globulin, but no iodine combines with it to form hormone. The thyroid gland gets bigger and bigger because of this. And the thyroid globulin is unstable. It's not what we need. But the only response we have is, well, let's make more of it. Let's make more of the thyroid globulin, even though we don't have the iodine. And so the thyroid enlarges. And you know, again, you know, one of the characteristics of uh, mixed edema may be an enlarged uh, uh, thyroid gland, a goiter uh, that can form it and get bigger and bigger. Because so there's no iodine. There's no iodine present, for example, then you're not going to make thyroid hormone, but the pituitary gland and the hypothalamus and the thyroid gland aren't going to know that. They're just going to busy, be busy turning out thyroid globulin. Now, with mixed edema, we see uh, there we go. <coughs> Characteristics of mixed edema. We see there is a lot of this. This is a more frequent occurrence. Uh, the face is puffy and dry. There are bags uh, underneath the eyeballs. That's a good indicator right there. Peri what we call periorbital edema. Uh, you know, look for this, pu this thick puffiness underneath the eyeballs. Uh, the whole face is puffy, but the eyeballs have these, these uh, the swelling under the eyeballs. Plus, they're going to be tired. They're going to be grumpy, they're going to be uh, lethargic, they're going to be constipated, which is probably why they're grumpy. Um, you know, they're, going to, they're not going to be, um, you know, they say mental sluggishness. So, so this, this is, a, this is a fix, usually a fixable problem. Now, here's another situation. Hyposecretion, you know, that whole, let me go back one. This is caused by a lack of thyroid hormone in an adult hyposecretion of thyroid hormone, mixed edema. In infants, it's a whole lot more significant. It leads to a condition known as cretinism. It causes severe intellectual and cognitive disabilities. Um, it causes a, it alters body development. The neck is short. The body is disproportionate in size. One of the things we notice that in a lot of conditions, the body is either proportionate or disproportionate. Um, you know, we notice that we know that uh, in uh, gigantism uh, or pituitary dwarfism, that while there is enlargement in, in gigantism, uh, except for some locations, everything is proportional. You know, a person's eight feet tall. The same with dwarfism. A four foot tall adult is proportionate in size. Here we see disproportionate sizes. We see uh, uh, the neck is very short and, is, uh, and the tongue is thick. You can see the physical changes there in the body. I don't know. I don't know about uh, hyposecretion. I don't know if they can outgrow cretinism. Um, that one, I'll, I, that one I will have to look up and get back to you on. I'm not sure. Uh, I guess perhaps if it's um, uh, occur if it's caught early, it could be it could be corrected uh, or outgrown. I don't. That's a very good question. So I will uh, I will look up that and get back to you on it. Thank you. Now, what about what else can cause goiters? You know, I'll, I'll go back to because cretinism doesn't occur very often. So, but goiters do. You're, you're very likely to see a, a goiter in your patient. 
um, except in the US where iodine, access to iodine is very common, it is probably the number one, lack of iodine is the number one cause of goiters around the world. You know, if a person in another country has a goiter, it's probably because they didn't get, enough, didn't get adequate iodine, aren't getting it in their diet. We get it in our table salt. Uh, and I keep forgetting to look up when that ha started happening. I can know that one too, table salt and iodine. But most of our salt is sold iodized. You know, um, you know it um, has iodine added to it. The, in fact, you have to look very hard to find salt. It isn't. Sea salt is usually uh, labeled as not iodized because sea salt that occurs naturally, uh, iodine might be present only as a trace. Um, we, if you'd like to eat a lot of seafood, there's a lot of iodine in seafood. Uh, and there may be iodine in our, in our drinking water. So I, I don't, it's not added, it just, it may be present. Uh, but there are, we, so we have, it's pretty unusual for a, to see a goiter in, in, in your patients locally is pretty unusual. There are two occurrences that would cause goiters um, that uh, one's fairly rare and one is obviously less rare. There are, if, if your patient has a goiter, it's likely gonna be caused by what is known as Hashimoto's disease or Graves disease. Hashimoto's disease or Graves, Graves disease. These are the common causes of goiters in the United States. And of course, if you have a patient with a malignancy or a benign tumor or, or a, a, a growth, a cyst, something growing that can cause the appearance of a goiter also. But here we see goiters. This one on the left uh, is iodine deficiency. You can see that the, the thyroid uh, is swollen up on one side, swollen up. It's enlarged uh, on one side. Uh, one of the, the uh, lobules is uh, significantly enlarged. On the, the patient on the right, uh, the picture on the right here, uh, Okay, so the patient on the right, uh, depending on where they live, may or may not be dealing with an iodine deficiency, but they may have one of these other conditions. They may have a uh, thyroid cancer, they may have a nodule, they may have Graves' disease, they may have Hashimoto's disease. Those are the, you know, those are the more common causes as I said, in the United States. Now your thyroid gland, when it does enlarge, will look like this. The thy enlarged thyroid gland, um, you can't even see the isthmus anymore in the middle of the gland. Um, the right-hand side of it is, is quite large. The lobule on the left side is, is pretty much disappeared. Don't know why. You know, is it cancerous? You know, why was it removed? Um, there was no explanation on the illustration, but it, you know, it is definitely uh, significantly larger than, it, than a normal size uh, thyroid gland. Now, in some cases, goiters can get massy. Take a look at this next one. You know, here we have a goiter that's the size of a football underneath the neck. Now the question is, of course, is you didn't wake up one morning and discover, wow, where did that come from? That's a long time in uh, in growing. So the um, but it occurred now because you can see both lobules here and here, and the isthmus is right in here. How this is you know, this is almost would consider this to be almost life threatening because of the size of the of, of the goiter. But that's nothing compared to this one. Let me go back. Sorry. Uh, judging by the type, the date on the age of the photograph, um, this this uh, may have been uh, 
quite a while ago. However, look at the size of the goiter. It surrounds his head. It, it's behind his neck. It's running down across his arms. You know, um, how does, you know, you know, again, how do you let this, how, how does this happen? How does this occur? And you will encounter patients like this that let things go and let things go. It's pretty unusual, but uh, patients, you know, um, lots of patients like to believe that if they ignore it, it'll go away. You know, hypertension is treated that way in a lot of people. If I ignore my blood pressure, the problem will go away. And it won't, but, you know, it, uh, people don't like to um, deal with stuff. Anyway, uh, this one probably was having a hard time being treated for whatever reason. But again, you know, if it's, if it's an iodine deficiency, it, the uh, presence of iodine is, is a quick fix in that. The same with this. Now, more than likely, both of these are dealing with some sort of uh, uh, more significant healthcare issue. Nobody uh, lets, lets their thyroid, nobody lets this go unless there's some underlying issue. Now, the two key problems in the United States for goiters are Graves disease and Hashimoto's disease. They are autoimmune disorders, meaning that our body attacks itself. You know, um, we talked a little bit about autoimmune disorders in AP1. We mentioned uh, um, multiple sclerosis, the autoimmune disorder that attacks the lining, the myelin lining of the, of the nervous system. Uh, we talked about myasthenia gravis a little bit. Those are autoimmune disorders. Now, how do we, you know, you know our body doesn't, rec you know, our immune system recognizes cells as self. Our immune system became immunocompetent in the first year of life when T cells got trained in the thymus and B cells got trained in the uh, bone marrow to recognize our cells as us. Um, difficult to diagnose Hashimoto's and Graves' disease. Um, they, these, there are some very characteristic symptoms that make it easy to uh, spot them quickly. Uh, there are symptoms that occur with both of these that are uh, pretty much unique uh, in here that you know, are going to you know, while we should always start out broadly and narrow down when we're doing any kind of di diagnostic activity, some of these conditions are, you know, um, so unique to these diseases that it, it's, it's fairly, it, it's easy to, to, to say, I'm pretty certain it's Graves or Hashimoto's. So, Hashimoto's is, um, Will you get a goiter if you, if you uh, treat early? Probably not. Um, the treatment is going to you know, prevent the goiter from developing. The goiter only develops if, the condition, if these conditions are going to go untreated. And it takes a while to get there. Early treatment is going is to solve, should uh, solve the problem. So let me, uh, that's a good question too. Yeah, I think, you know, goiter is one of the signs that, that the condition is there. Um, of course, our bodies are, are peculiar because we don't necessarily have to have the goiter, you know, but there are some characteristic symptoms here. Number one cause uh, of, well, let me back up here. Hypothyroidism, you know, where we're looking at the potential for the goiter in particular, the number one cause of that in the U.S. is Hashimoto's disease. Um, Graves' disease is just the opposite. Graves' disease is hyperthyroidism. So we have two different, you know, two opposing types of or antagonistic types of conditions, both of which can end up with a goiter uh, in here. 
Graves disease, hyperthyroidism, your thyroid is overactive. Hashimoto's, hypothyroidism, the thyroid is underactive. Now, let's take a look here at this. Hypersecretion of thyroid hormone, Graves disease. It is an autoimmune disorder. Uh, the um, antibodies, this is, this is really fascinating how it does. It's not unless you have it, you know, it's not fascinating. But the antibody, you know, when we're exposed to foreign substances, pathogens, transplanted tissue, something like that, pathogens of any kind, uh, our B cells make what are known as antibodies to target those cells for destruction, you know, target the invaders, the pathogens, whatever, the transplanted tissue for destruction or to be inactivated. So they, they glom onto the, uh, the, the, uh, the non-self structures, if you will. Well, in Graves' disease, we, may, we recognize our own tissue as abnormal and we produce abnormal antibodies and the antibodies attack the follicle cells that are, you know, that are around the outside of the, of the, of the follicles. The follicle, that makes a good, that's a good place for the follicle cells around the follicle that make the thyroid globulin. The antibodies, instead of trying to destroy the uh, follicle cells, cause them to go into overdrive. The, follic the antibodies mimic thyroid stimulating hormone and they cause the follicle cells to produce large quantities of thyroid lobulin. And so you, your patient has massive release of thyroid lobulin. Uh, if they can't, you know, if they don't have enough iodine, well, it doesn't really matter. They're overproducing thyroid lobulin. The thyroid's going to enlarge. The, uh, your patient will have an elevated heart rate, they're going to be, have weight loss, they're going to be uh, agitated, uh, they're going to eat everything in sight and lose weight. Uh, they're going, you know, their metabolic rate is going to be sky high. They're, um, are, you know, they will be unable to focus and, and they'll be unable to um, uh, do normal activities because they're so busy, they're, they're, caught, they're agitated. It's like, constantly going from one thing to another. Um, one of the characteristic signs of Graves' disease is bulging eyeballs. Um, the tissue behind the eye swells up and it, it uh, develops a lot of fibroblast tissue. Fibroblast tissue is essentially scar tissue back there. So the the tissue enlarges and becomes like scar tissue and pushes the eyeballs out and they bulge. And it is a characteristic sign of Graves' disease. Uh, nothing, else, nothing, else, you know, nothing else quite does, does that kind of symptom except Graves' disease. Now, how do you treat it? Well, radioactive iodine early on, because radioactive iodine, if you remember back to AP1, Iodine is only taken up by the thyroid. If you have radioactive iodine, only radio, the radioactive iodine will all go to the thyroid, nowhere else. And it can destroy uh, some of the enough cells uh, that are being attacked to bring them back down um, to produce normal levels of thyroid lobulin. In extreme cases, you take out the entire thyroid gland and then you have to have constant uh, you know, replacement therapy of uh, thyroid hormone. This is what the bulging eyeballs look like. You know, they, um, they will, uh, it, it is quite prominent in here. There are, you know, it is, this is the, one of the characteristic symptoms of, um, of Graves' disease. So with everything else going on with the agitation and the weight loss and the nervousness uh, and the uh, irregular heartbeat, the rapid heartbeat, the constant hunger, because they're burning up everything they eat. 
you know, the high metabolic activity is going to be causing the, you know, the calorie burn probably double. And yet there's going to be so much um, uh, thyroid lobulin produced in the thyroid gland. You probably likely saw it and give you the goiter uh, appearance underneath there. Can be caught early on. You know, lots of things can be given away there. Um, you can have you know, weight loss. You can detect agitation. You can detect the eyeballs slightly bulging. You know, all sorts of indicators here um, that there's something going on and can be caught early. But the symptoms are very characteristic. Now, Hashimoto's disease is hypothyroidism. Graves' disease is hyperthyroidism. Hashimoto's is hypo. And it is the most common cause of hypothyroidism in the US. About um, 5% of the population are affected by it. You know, five out of every hundred, so that's 5% of the population. Um, I don't know why it's more common in women than men um, and why it goes after people in middle age. So what happens here is, again, it deals with the follicle cells. The immune system, it's again, as an autoimmune, it will attack the follicle cells instead of mimicking TSH and causing overproduction of overactivity of, of the thyroid, it just destroys the follicle cells. So you're not gonna make any thyroid hormone. And so you get your goiter produced this way. Because then with, with, the, with the lack of thyroid, with, with the lack of, thyro of thyroid hormone production, your goiter will enlarge trying to compensate for the lack of uh, thyroid lobulin. So you get the swelling and enlargement there. And here we see, you know, here is another example of the goiter right here. You can see both lobules uh, take a color. And you can actually, if you look carefully, you can see where the isthmus is located, the lobule on both sides there. So you are preventing thyroid hormone production. Uh, we're releasing lots of TSH, TSH. We're stimulating the remaining cells to produce uh, thyroid lobulin. The thyroid gets bigger and bigger and trying to compensate here. So again, uh, a goiter is not unusual in this one. Um, hypothyroidism, the, the symptoms would be very, uh, would be um, apparent, you know, lethargy, tiredness, cold, um, constipation. It would uh, start uh, mimicking myxedema, uh, you know, all these conditions here. You, you know, your patient's kind of being run down. They just don't have any interest in doing anything. Tired, you know, and that's a that's a pretty broad area to start from. You know, uh, blood work would very quickly uh, show thyroid hormone levels would be low, and that would be the giveaway right there. It, this is something you probably can't diagnose just looking at your patient. Blood work, blood work will tell you because the thyroid hormone levels. Um, but you'd have to have blood work in both Hashimoto's and Graves. But blood work will tell you that the thyroid hormone levels are low. It may not tell you it's Hashimoto's disease, but it will tell you that your thyroid hormone levels are low. And now you're you're on the you know now it's an endocrine problem that you need to work with. So um, first indicators are going to be tiredness, lethargy, um, uh, lack of appetite constipation. Uh, the, the problem with you have is you have your older patients that um, they're not going to, they're going to have this mental sluggishness and maybe uh, it's going to appear that they are developing a dementia. Maybe not. You know, thyroid hormone uh, blood work is going to show you right away uh, if it's going to be a thyroid problem or not. And it's, it, you know, it, it is, um, it's treatable. Again, uh, you would have to more than likely um, go on thyroid hormone replacement therapy to treat this. 
because you're not getting thyroid hormone naturally. So how do you turn off an autoimmune disorder? That, that does become a problem. So other, other things to consider, thyroid cancer. Thyroid cancer, 60,000 cases a year in the US. Um, usually affects people under 55. Again, more adult women than men, just like we saw in, Hash in Hashimoto's. It's more women than men. I don't know why. The, the good news about thyroid cancer is that it's easily detectable and it has a very, very high cure rate because you detect it early. Um, you uh, can treat with radiation, you can remove the thyroid gland. There's all sorts of, you know, you have numerous options to treat uh, a cancerous thyroid. And so the, the, uh, you know, the survival rate is, is, is quite high um, on this, it, you know, as long as it's not ignored. Now here we see, uh, and this is a PET scan of, um, of an individual with uh, thyroid cancer and it has uh, spread. We see uh, the, you know, the thyroid gland located here. It, PET scans work with, remember, um, PET scans work for cancer, uh, cancerous uh, malignancies for tumors because tumors have a high uptake of uh, glucose. And so we can see where in the picture, in the, in the PET scan here, where um, the cancer cells have spread, uh, metastasized from the thyroid gland itself. We see that they're in the cervical uh, lymph nodes here, and they're in um, the uh, media, in, in the lymph nodes in the mediastinum in the middle of the chest. So they have spread. This is not cancer. This is just part of the dye that picks up. It's given to uh, detect the, the uh, presence of glucose. So uh, we have a lot of uh, movement here of these cancer cells, and it could have been caught early. Could have been caught very early. Anyway. Okay, so that those are the conditions you're going to encounter. Thyroid cancer is probably the most common. Hashimoto's and uh, Graves' disease are your autoimmunes. Uh, Hashimoto's, 5% of your patients may develop, statistically may develop uh, uh, Hashimoto's. Both are autoimmune disorders. Those are treatable and can be caught early. Um, yeah. and, it, it, and more than likely it's gonna involve some sort of replacement therapy, um, thyroid replacement therapy if the thyroid has to be destroyed or taken out. Let's take a look at the other hormone that comes out of the thyroid gland, and that's calcitonin. Calcitonin is made by the parafollicular cells. Parafollicular cells are those cells that are in between the follicles. They're clusters of cells. Uh, they're, not, they're not follicular cells that surround the follicle. They are clustered in, in between the follicles. They um, are produced when calcium levels are elevated. We are very rarely going to have that situation in a normal healthy individual where we have high blood calcium levels. But because if our blood calcium goes up, the calcium, you know, it's only when blood calcium gets elevated that our calcitonin gets released to stimulate uh, osteoblast production, taking the calcium and embedding it in, in new bone. Um, we don't usually see that situation. Um, only if we have high levels of blood calcium. The, um, we, because if we, if calcium levels are high, calcitonin stimulates osteoblast to build bone, it inhibits the osteoclast that break down bone. We're usually never in a, in a, we're usually, we usually never have a normal surplus of calcium. So calcitonin is not um, a prime regulator of anything. It's there. We produce calcitonin when needed, but it is not the, it is not a regulator of calcium levels in the blood. 
we very rarely have elevated calcium. But this is where they're located. Parafollicular cells are here, because you know, here's a follicle. Here are the follicular cells here on the outside of the follicle. And there are the parafollicular cells sort of tucked away there in between the follicles there and down here and probably something up there too. So we, you know, and, and I showed you this last week in lab. So the, the, the parafollicular cells are there, but, and they're gonna release calcitonin on the, on the occurrences when calcium gets too high. It doesn't happen very often, if at all. More importantly, for regulating calcium level is uh, parathyroid hormone. This is, the, this is the number one regulator of blood calcium levels in the body. The parathyroid glands, there are four of them, found on the posterior surface of the thyroid gland, or at least four of them. And he saw them uh, last week in lab. The parathyroid glands secrete parathyroid hormone. And they're, as I said, they're embedded on the posterior surface. Um, they're um, located you know, right in the middle of, of the posterior surface of the thyroid gland. When, when calcium levels drop, they are stimulated. That's that numeral stimulus we talked about uh, a couple of days ago that they are stimulated to release parathyroid hormone. That activates osteoclasts, the bone breakers. Uh, the osteoclasts contain lots of lysosomes and uh, they dissolve away the bone. And so the calcium gets released, blood calcium comes back up. We stop making, uh, a stop releasing parathyroid hormone. Osteoclast activity, is um, shut down. We're also parathyroid hormone. Also, parathyroid hormone also tells us to retain more calcium in our kidneys and more calcium in our small intestine. So we recover calcium in the kidneys and calcium in the small intestine, in addition to stimulating the osteoclast activity of breaking down bone and inhibiting osteoblasts. It will go after our bones. It will go at, it will tell, it will break down bone. It will recover from the kidneys and it will recover uh, in, the, in the small intestine. So here's where they're located. And there are four of them there. It says four to eight, usually four. And again, if we're looking at perspective, they're about the size and shape of a raisin, each one of them. And I showed you in lab last week uh, what they look like. They're, you know, the, they have a, a, a much more secretory structural shape than does the thyroid gland. Because remember, the, you could see on one of the slides, you could see the follicles uh, and the follicle cells and the parathyroid uh, gland locations. And then you'd have the, the uh, large in perspective of the thyroid gland picture, um, the parathyroid gland, very secretory structures. Uh, so but there's our parathyroid gland, and it will, as I said, break down bone, stimulate osteoclast activity, inhibit osteoblast. It will tell us to absorb uh, more calcium in the kidneys, it will cause the kidneys also to activate vitamin D, which allows us to absorb uh, calcium in the, in the small intestine. The um, kidneys have to turn on the vitamin D that we've made in our skin. You know, ultraviolet radiation shines on our skin, stimulates the production of vitamin D. We have to activate that vitamin D, and that will allow us to absorb calcium in our gut, in the small intestine. So this, this little flow chart here gives you everything you need to know of parathyroid hormone. I mean, usually I'm not big in these kind of charts, but you are 
uh, your patient is hypocalcemic. We'll talk about hypocalcemia later, much later on in the semester in fluid and electrolytes. But your patient is hypocalcemic. Their blood calcium is low. Parathyroid hormone gets released from the parathyroid glands, stimulates osteoclast activity to break down bone and release calcium, tells the kidneys to reabsorb calcium in the kidney tubules. Kidneys also activate vitamin D, which allows calcium to be absorbed from food in the small intestine. And that all raises our blood calcium levels. And so that's why parathyroid hormone is the number one calcium regulator in the blood. Calcitonin is just watching. It is not a significant player. Problems with uh, parathyroid hormone, just like any, anything else, it can be hyperparathyroid. Uh, if there is a tumor in, para, in one of the parathyroid glands, it will stimulate overproduction. Um, the bones will get soft. Bones are, you know, calcium is going to leach out of those bones. Those bones will get soft. Uh, bones will break very easily. Um, the, um, they'll deform. So they can, they'll, they'll bend and snap very quickly. Uh, the, uh, your patient can have numerous kidney stones. I mean, the kidney stones are called renal calculi. And so you get lots of calcium being retained in the uh, kidneys, forming stones. Kidney stones are very painful for people. Um, the nervous system is depressed. Excess calcium you know, in, you know, in the nervous system uh, is going to uh, slow nerve, nerve activity down you know, because and consider what does calcium do for, for nerve impulse as well. It doesn't do a whole lot on as like sodium and potassium does, but it does open up the uh, calcium, you know, the calcium channels open up for uh, the release of the neurotransmitter, stimulate the release of neurotransmitter. If you over-release your neurotransmitter, all sorts of bad things happen. Uh, so you see, uh, if you're hyperparathyroid, you know, your patient, patient likely can't support their weight of their bones. Uh, they're going to fracture easily. They may have kidney stones going on here. Um, and so your symptoms, you know, bones are weak, bones are fragile. Um, kidney stones, any number of these could be an indicator here. Uh, X-ray would show you right away that the bones, there's something going on with the bones. Now, uh, and I'll show you an x-ray here in a second. Hypoparathyroidism would occur if the thyroid gland had been removed and the thyroid gland would come out with the parathyroid glands too if the whole gland were removed. Um, if you don't have um, parathyroid gland or the parathyroid gland is inactive, then you end up... The, yeah, it can lead to death. Uh, you know, muscle paralysis uh, can occur. You know, because what do we need calcium for? We need calcium for muscle contractions. If our calcium levels drop, we don't get contractions, and we go into us. You know, we we mimic rigor. Uh, muscles become paralyzed, and you know, in the heart, we we'll see that uh, calcium is used in place of sodium. So, you know. Bad things really happen. You know, like, like your patient dies uh, if, if the uh, parathyroid hormone levels drop. So again, you know, a patient who would have their thyroid removed or irradiated, or if you know, if for whatever reason you could uh, you, you couldn't maintain the parathyroid glands at all, they would have to go on uh, hormone replacement therapy, both for the thyroid gland and for the parathyroid gland. Now this is what that um, condition of hyperparathyroidism would look like in sucking out the uh, calcium from the bones. You know, here we see a um, look at the, the gaps in the bones of, of the uh, of the hand. 
you know, these dark spots shouldn't, there's dark areas shouldn't be that, that is where calcium has been leached out. Those, those bones are fragile. Here we see a tibia and a fibula. Note the dark areas in there. Uh, that could easily be a situation where your patient's just standing in line somewhere or just standing still and uh, their bone, their, uh, the tibia snaps. Uh, or they go to, you know, imagine turning a doorknob and your fingers break because the bones are very, very weak. That since the calcium is, is being leached out drastically. Yeah. And you have to figure out how, you know, what's causing it. Uh, when you see this kind of x-ray, the indicator indication is that it's, you gotta start thinking endocrine, endocrine, because you know, there are very few things that cause calcium to disappear from bones uh, than you know, an overproduction of parathyroid hormone. And of course, kidney stones, you know, uh, too much calcium, you know, you're overproducing cal uh, parathyroid hormone in it, you know, all that calcium you're taking out of the bones, well, it's going to end up somewhere. It's going to end up trapped in the kidneys and form stones. And these, you know, this, this stone is probably the size of a quarter. Uh, and if you've ever experienced a kidney stone, it is excruciatingly painful. Uh, sharp edged stones going through the kidneys. Um, working their way down through the ureter into the bladder. And then either if, if your patient's lucky enough, they can pass the stone. If not, it has to be broken apart. So uh, a great deal of uh, problems here. So, and, and, and again, it can be the kind of thing where your patient presents with kidney stones. And, and you, you want to make sure that it isn't some other overriding condition. Because where's the calcium coming from? You know, if your patient is not uh, taking excessive, you know, antacids. I mean, um, if you if your if your patient was uh, chewing up uh, tums every day, lots and lots of tums, for example, because they like the flavor of maybe they like fruit flavored tums. I mean, you know what tums are? Tums are antacid tablets, mostly calcium carbonate. Uh, and the fruit flavored ones have a little fruit flavoring in there, and maybe they like to eat the fruit flavored ones. I don't know. But overindulgence in calcium can cause that. Yeah. So, uh, why would they be having kidney stones? What causes a kidney stone? Yeah. Um, and so, you have to ask yourself what caused the kidney stone? Was it the, the cousin or, you know, are they eating two pounds of, uh, of uh, Tums every day? Or is there some underlying condition here? So are they not getting enough water in your diet that they're retaining too many salts? You have to find out, you know, when you see kidney stones, you have to think, is there something else taking place? Okay, let's go on to the next one. The adrenal glands. The adrenal glands sit on top of the kidneys. The kidney is about three inches long. The adrenal glands are about half that size. There is no direct connection between the kidney and the adrenal glands. It's just a convenient location for them. Um, they um, have, they're really two glands. They have an outer layer and an inner layer. The cortex is the outer layer. It produces three different types of hormones. The inner layer is the medulla, and it produces epinephrine and norepinephrine in here. The medulla is the area of our, uh, is where we respond to fight or flight when we produce epinephrine and norepinephrine. The adrenal glands still retain the old name adrenal, uh, and we uh, used to call uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine adrenaline. Some people probably still do. So the medulla is directly controlled by the nervous system because when we go into a fight or, fight or flight mode, the sympathetic nervous system triggers fight or flight and the sympathetic nervous system tells the adrenal glands, release the epinephrine, release the norepinephrine. So it's under that kind of control. So, so our adrenal, gland, adrenal cortex consists of three layers. We looked at these last week and if you confess that they all look the same, that 
wouldn't be the first time anybody's ever said that because the first time you look at it, they do all look the same. But the three layers are the zona glomerulosa, the zona fasciculata, and the zona reticularis. So the uh, glomerulosa, fasciculata, and reticularis. Now, if you're looking at your slide, the adrenal glands are like a lot of these organs that have a cortex and a medulla. They also have an outside covering called the capsule. And the capsule is sits right on top of the um, zona glomerulosa. So if you look at a, a, a cross section of the adrenal gland, and the outer, the, the very outermost edge is the capsule. Directly underneath that is the zona glomerulosa. So you've already got one of the, the zones figured out. Now the zona glomerulosa uh, produces mineral corticoids. And the most important of these is something called aldosterone. And we're gonna hear about aldosterone again and again as we go through AMP2. Aldosterone is a very key hormone it helps to regulate fluid levels. It regulates blood pressure. Um, it's a significant hormone that we, we regulate very carefully. It's also probably the driver behind why we graduate. We gradually elevate see our elevation of blood pressure over time as we age. The second layer is the zona fasciculata. Zona fasciculata is what we, it produces what we call the glucocorticoids. Cortisol, it works to help regulate our glucose levels. It, it isn't just about insulin. You know, insulin is gonna work to bring our glucose levels down when we eat something, that's what it does. Cortisol helps to maintain our glucose level at a constant amount throughout our bodies. You're giving us the glucose we need on a consistent basis. No hormone operates in a vacuum. You know, blood glucose levels uh, are going to be controlled by a variety of hormones, and cortisol is one of the players here too. The reticularis, the innermost layer directly above the medulla, is the gonadocorticoids. The gonadocorticoids are sex hormones, uh, usually called androgens. The androgens are male sex hormones, testosterone, that in the female are converted to estrogen. The structural chemistry is very similar in here. Uh, the end result is significantly different. Structural chemistry is similar. So the androgens are produced by the adrenal glands. And if it's, if you know, depending on a male or female, it either, it either becomes testosterone or becomes estrogen. And these are the regions that we see here. Here is the um, capsule on the outer edge of the adrenal gland with the zona glomerulosa directly underneath that, the fasciculata directly underneath that, and the reticularis underneath that. And then directly below the reticularis is the adrenal medulla where we produce the epinephrine and norepinephrine. So from an, uh, an anatomical perspective, if you can, if you can see the, the capsule and see the medulla, then you can ident identify all three layers of the, of the cortex. Since the glomerulosa is right underneath the capsule and the reticularis is right above the medulla, or at least the fasciculata in the middle. So anyway, now, so what do they? What do these different zones do? What do these different uh, uh, cord uh, the uh, cord these corticotropic hormones do? Well, the zona glomerulosa produces mineral corticoids. It regulates our helps to regulate our fluid levels, usually sodium and potassium, in what we call the extracellular fluid. That would be interstitial fluid and plasma. Salt levels and sodium and potassium levels in the fluid outside of the cells. Sodium is very, very important to us. Sodium adjusts our water volume, 
our blood volume, our blood pressure. When we get into the kidneys later on, we're going to see that water will follow sodium. They always say water follows salt. Well, it sort of does. You know, if the sodium level goes up, uh, that means that water level is down. Sodium level is high, water level is down in the body. If water level is up, sodium levels are down. So we regulate based on sodium. We regulate the water levels in our bodies based on sodium. The hypothalamus can monitor the sodium level very easily in our bodies. If sodium is high, water is low, always. If sodium high is high, water is low. If sodium is low, water is high. Because we generally don't lose sodium, at least not like we lose water every day. The amount of sodium stays fairly constant in our bodies. Water fluctuates. If our water level drops, our sodium level is, is detected as high. And that tells us that we're thirsty. And your throat's dry and you're thirsty and whatever. If water levels are, if sodium is low, that means we got to pee because our water levels are too high. So, so sodium, very, very, very important to us. Elevates blood pressure. It regulates blood volume. If we retain a lot of sodium, <clears throat> we're going to have a lot of water following that. Potassium. Most important thing potassium does for us is sets the potential, the potential charge on the membrane. That's resting membrane potential, RMP. You know, what's the charge on a muscle cell? Minus 90 millivolts. The charge on a nerve cell, minus 70 millivolts, set by the presence of potassium. So the mineral corticoids regulate all this. And aldosterone is the number one mineral corticoid at work here. Aldosterone regulates sodium levels. And that tells us all sorts of stuff. Aldosterone turns on the sodium potassium pump. Um, it pumps out sodiums for potassiums. Uh, we regulate, uh, I'll get to this here in a second, what do we, what controls aldosterone? Aldosterone, essentially, aldosterone tells us to retain sodium. When our bodies retain sodium, when our sodium levels go up, it's because our water level, if sodium levels go up, water levels are down. So how do we fix that? We bring in more water. If we retain sodium or if we gain sodium, we need to gain water. Think about this. You go to a restaurant, um, you, know, uh, you go to a, your favorite restaurant, and there's a Mexican restaurant, for example, and they're serving chips and salsa. Yeah. Um, and so you eat the chips and you dip the salsa. Well, the chips are salty. Everybody expects the chips to be salty. Well, why, why do they give you salty chips? To make you thirsty. And so the more salty chips you eat, the more salt you're putting into your, in, into, into your system. And the hypothalamus says, hey, we're getting salty. We need more water. So you drink more water. Or in the case of the restaurant, they want you to drink something else, something that is a, you know, a, gives them a, higher, a better profit margin than just water. So when we take in sodium, when we retain sodium, we have to take in water to balance it. If our sodium levels are up, it's be, it means that our water levels are down. So we have to bring in water to compensate for that because water follows sodium in our bodies. So if we release aldosterone, it will cause us to retain sodium. And that causes us to retain water. And what, that, what does that do to our blood pressure? Our blood pressure goes up then. If we retain water, thanks to sodium, how does that affect our blood pressure? Well, it's because when we retain water, where's that water going to end up? It's going to end up in our plasma. Water always ends up in our plasma. It increases our blood volume. If we increase, if we drink a lot of water, it goes into our blood. It ends up in our plasma. And if we increase our blood 
if we increase our blood volume, guess who has to work harder to pump that? The heart. And when, it, when the heart works harder, it elevates the blood pressure. So retaining sodium, which is what aldosterone does, if we retain sodium, we increase our blood volume and we increase our blood pressure. What do we tell hypertensive patients not to eat a lot of sodium, salt? Don't eat a lot of salt because it'll uh, cause you to retain water, which will cause a rise in blood pressure. So how does this all work? Well, renin, there's a mechanism called the renin angiotensin aldosterone mechanism. If our blood pressure drops, and this is a perfectly normal mechanism, our blood pressure drops, the kidneys release a substance, a, a hormone known as renin. We'll talk a lot about this when we get into the kidneys. Renin takes, converts a hormone that's in solution, or I'm sorry, a protein that's in solution, known as angiotensinogen. And it converts that to angiotensin. Angiotensin two, it goes through angiotensin one to angiotensin two. Angiotensin two stimulates the release of aldosterone from um, the zona glomerulosa. So if your blood pressure goes down, we want to bring it up. For whatever reason, if your blood pressure is depressed, we will bring our blood pressure up by stimulating the release of aldosterone. Angiotensin 1 is converted to angiotensin 2, which stimulates the release of aldosterone. Aldosterone tells our kidneys to retain sodium, which causes us to retain more water, which increases our blood volume, which raises our blood pressure. So aldosterone is a very powerful elevator of blood pressure. It increases blood volume. We retain sodium. And so we retain, we retain sodium to retain water, increasing our blood volume, increasing our blood pressure, brings our blood pressure back up to normal. And that's all well and good, except when our blood pressure starts becoming elevated because we're releasing more aldosterone than we need. So the number one mechanism though for um, responding to low, to low blood pressure is renin, angiotensin aldosterone. The kidneys detect low blood pressure. You wouldn't think the kidneys would be doing that, but the kidneys detect low blood pressure. Six, you know, they filter our blood, entire blood supply 60 times a day. So they have a pretty good handle of what's going on with our blood. So if our blood pressure drops, the kidneys release renin, which stimulates um, angiotensinogen to become angiotensin one and then converted to angiotensin two, which causes the release of aldosterone from the zone of glomerulosa. Something else that triggers aldosterone, potassium. If potassium levels um, go up, if potassium levels go up, then we um, release aldosterone. Why? Because, I'm glad you missed. Uh, sorry, that was sarcasm. Why? Because if potassium levels are up, it will trigger aldosterone. Aldosterone retains sodium at the expense of the potassium. Aldosterone will cause us to release, for every sodium we retain, we kick out a potassium. So we're, if, if our potassium levels are too high, we can get rid of the potassium by retaining sodium, but also elevating our blood pressure. ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone from the pituitary gland can trigger the release of aldosterone when we get stressed. And ANP is an antagonist to aldosterone. ANP released by the atria of our heart. If blood pressure gets too elevated, Gets too elevated. If blood pressure gets elevated, then we will the heart will release atrial natriuretic peptide (ANP). That's why we call it ANP. We'll release ANP to reverse the aldosterone 
to drop our blood pressure back to where it belongs. Short-term localized fix, not a long-term fix, can't overwhelm long-term effects of long-term exposure to long-term release of aldosterone. So aldosterone, number one player in regulating blood pressure, fluid levels in the body, sodium levels, and potassium levels. It's responsible, the release of aldosterone is responsible for elevating blood pressure. You know, it's a gradual process. We retain, the more sodium we retain, the more water we retain. The more water we retain, the greater the blood volume is, the, the greater the blood volume is, the harder the heart has to work and raise blood pressure. Everything we eat and everything we drink ends up in our blood. All water, all fluids we take in end up in our blood. So if we eat salty foods, we're going to retain more. We're going to drink, we're going to be thirsty. We're going to drink fluids, and we're going to all those fluids are going to go into our blood, increase our blood volume. If we retain sodium, salt, we're going to uh, retain water. We're going to draw in more water, increasing our blood volume. So water follows salt. Water follows sodium. Just to throw this out, there now, chlorine doesn't have much to do with all this. Chlorine's not a major, chlorine is not a player in this, you know, salt and potassium and elevated blood pressure uh, arena. So chlorine doesn't get to do a whole lot. It's just sort of there. Sodium and potassium are the key players. And if we if we if we retain a lot of sodium, we're going to get a, we're going to start uh, uh, retaining water because the water will always follow the sodium. Problems with aldosterone. Just like anything else, we can hypersecrete and hyposecrete aldosterone. Uh, if we hypersecrete aldosterone, it's because of a usually because of a tumor on the adrenal cortex. You may see a rise in blood pressure. That's hypertension. You know, if you are over secreting aldosterone. You're going to see a drastic increase in drastic retention in sodium caused by more water retention caused by a rise in blood pressure. Uh, but it doesn't stop there. Excess sodium causes us to kick out high levels of potassium. If we get rid of the potassium, we alter the charge on the membranes, on the muscle cells, and on the neurons. And then we have all sorts of issues. The neuron, we have neurological issues because the, the nervous system is, can't work because there's not enough potassium present for to depolarize and repolarize. You may depolarize and not be able to repolarize a muscle or a nerve. Consider that. So if you have excessive sodium, you're going to kick out the, you're going to be kicking out a lot more potassium than you should. So hypersecretion of aldosterone causes a drastic rise in sodium, drastic rise in water intake and blood pressure, and a significant, greater than significant loss of potassium. And the consequences can become dire at that point. Other problems, Addison's disease. Addison's disease, it is a condition that affects both the zone of glomerulosa uh, and the glucocorticoids. Addison's disease is hypersecretion of, I'm sorry, hyposecretion of aldosterone and hyposecretion of cortisol, of the glucocorticoids. So you are, Addison's disease, you are hyposecreting two different hormones. With Addison's disease, you see weight loss, you see glucose levels drop, you see sodium levels drop, you see potassium being going up. Remember, if, if sodium goes down, potassium goes up. If, if sodium levels drop, we, we retain more potassium. If potassium levels, um, uh, if, if sodium goes up, we kick out the potassium. So if sodium's going down, because it will, if we are not secreting aldosterone, 
our sodium levels are going to drop because aldosterone is what tells us to retain sodium. Aldosterone levels drop, we are going to retain <clears throat> lots of potassium. We are going to um, see, uh, we're going to become dehydrated. Why? Because we don't have any sodium. So if the sodium levels are low, then we're not going to have any desire to, to uh, bring in water. If our, if our sodium levels are low, the hypothalamus is saying, hey, we're not thirsty at all. We got plenty of water. So we become dehydrated. Um, our blood pressure drops. You know, no sodium, less water. We are hypotensive. So um, it's not going to be one of those, you know, it leads to imminent death. Um, but it is, <clears throat> it is a chronic condition. Addison's disease with the combination of a lack of aldosterone and a lack of uh, glucose, of glucocorticoids, you know, has some significant impacts on your patient. Weight loss, you know, uh, why weight loss? Because they're burning up their, cal their stored uh, calories uh, and stored uh, food supplies to make up for the, the lack of uh, glucose. You know, the cortisol is not present to stimulate, you know, glucose uptake. Water levels are going to drop. Weight, you're going to have weight loss. You're not retaining water. So let's talk about Addison's disease a little bit. One of the characteristics of Addison's disease is increased levels of pigmentation. Um, we become hyperpigmented. Increased levels of pigmentation. Now look at the, the two hands in the illustration here, the one on the left is a patient with Addison's disease, the one on the right is a patient without Addison's disease. And you say, well, what about you know, skin color? You can't tell. Yes, you can. Look at nail beds. Look at the uh, lips. Same way we, we would identify uh, cyanosis. You know, certain areas of the skin are not, you know, palms of the hand, melanin uh, levels, uh, can't throw you a curve there, you know. It doesn't matter what color the, of, the, of the skin is. If you want to look for cyanosis, look at the lips, look at the nail beds. They're gonna turn blue, no matter what skin color it is. The same thing is gonna happen here with Addison's disease. You're gonna see a hyperpigmentation here. Uh, so Addison's disease caused by a lack of aldosterone and a lack of cortisol. You lose glucose thanks to the cortisol. You lose sodium thanks to the aldosterone. You're going to be dehydrated. You're going to have low blood pressure. You're going to have weight loss. They're going to, your patient's going to be tired. The, they may become uh, psychotic, unlikely. They may suffer depression. Mood swings may occur. Uh, the giveaway, the giveaway, you know, First, first thing it's going to indicate um, is pigmentation changes, increased levels of, of melanin in, in the skin. That's going to be the first symptom here. Blood work will show you sodium levels are low, glucose levels are low, water levels are low, blood pressure, you know, your patient's hyper, hypotensive, big red flag right there, that's going to push you down a certain pathway. Are they dehydrated? You can look at the skin and tell if they're dehydrated by the way the skin is, 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 is uh, wrinkling up. You know, dehydration is a good, a good indicator of dehydration is skin wrinkles frequently. You know, it tends up and doesn't let go. You know, so we see here, this little chart gives you a whole slew of information on Addison's disease, uh, you know, the um, low blood pressure, weight loss, decreased appetite, craving salt because they're low in sodium, low blood sugar, uh, loss of body hair, nausea and vomiting, pigmentation, you know, any number of these things here. Um, one out of every 100,000 people in the US will develop this. Um, so, okay, I'm going to stop here at Addison's disease, and we will move in.
into glucocorticoids and we'll come back to Addison's disease when we talk about problems with uh, hyposecretion of cortisol. Lab this afternoon is going to be on the reproductive structures. So um, we'll be going, you know, some of them you've already seen from last week, like the testes uh, and the ovaries, but we'll go over the rest of the reproductive structures uh, then. So. Okay, any questions on anything? I am gonna look up cretinism um, and uh, when table salt and iodine uh, came together. So, so, and I'll get these posted, uh, these videos will show up in YouTube and I'll send you all the links later today. So, otherwise we're gonna get out of here so we can get, I can get ready for lab and I'll see you, uh, I guess, in a half an hour.